New Westminster Veterans Oral History Project. Today's date is December 17, 2001. The interviewee is Mr. Richard Peel, who is with the Royal Winnipeg Rifles. Mr. Peel, what is your full name? John Thomas Richard Peel. And what is your date and place of birth? My date and date of birth is January the 15th. 1920 in, I'd say, in East Bay, Manitoba. And what is your marital status? Married. And your wife's name and maiden name? Well, my wife's maiden name was, uh, well, her name now is Peel, but her maiden name was, uh, oh, oh. Yeah. Here Did you have I and Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Julian. Okay. And do you have any children? Yeah, I have one daughter named Dolores. And uh, is she living around here or? She's in Kelowna. She's in Kelowna. She lives in Kelowna. Good. Good. So, um, where were your parents from? My parents, my mother was from England, born in England. Mm -hmm. My father was born in. Uh, Ontario, mm -hmm. Sault Ste. Marie. Okay. And um, what is your current address? My current address? Yeah. 8165 12th Avenue, Burnaby. Okay. And have, have you lived in the New Westminster area for a long time? 30 years. 30 years, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, where did you live? I lived in Burnaby, or by the Burnaby Hospital. Oh, okay. Spruce Street. Spruce Street. Okay, well, thank you. So, tell me, what branch of the armed forces were you enrolled in? I enrolled in the Ar Army, mm -hmm. the Royal Winnipeg Rifles, right. in June 25th, 1940. And, and what was your rank and position? Oh, just a rifleman. And what were the duties that you were trained for? I was uh, I was trained driver mechanic. Okay, okay. And uh, so, uh, when did, when did you get discharged then? Oh, uh, it was in August, nineteen forty-five. Nineteen forty-five. Okay. So tell me, when you enrolled, what did your parents think? Well, I had an awful time. Well, my mother didn't want to give me my birth certificate, which I had to have because I looked so young when I joined up at 20 years old. I didn't believe that I was 20 years old. Right, right. Yeah. And your mom didn't want to give it to you? Yeah, she didn't want to give it to me, but hey, I got it. So. <laughs> what about your dad? Well, he wasn't around. He was out here in the coast at that time. They oh. were separated. So. Oh, okay, okay. So when you enrolled, did you enroll with friends or buddies or just on your own? Yeah, all well, my buddies were going, so if I could drive out, we'll get in the beat. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. And when you heard that Canada declared war on Germany, what what did you feel? Well, uh, it was two o'clock in the morning. I was working a night shift, hauling wood into a powerhouse in Dolphin, Manitoba, and I stopped for a, at two o'clock. I stopped for a piece of pie and a drink a coffee at the cafe every night for a pick-me-up. Yeah. When you handle a 17 quart of wood a night, you're kind of you're tired about that time. <laughs> right, right. So you heard it on the radio or what? I'd come over the radio, yeah. Yeah. Come and over the radio in the cafe. Oh, I see. How did you feel? Well, I said, uh, I said, it was just about time. Somebody stepped on that Hitler. Oh, really? You knew it was coming then, eh? I knew it was filming. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so obviously it was your choice to join. You yeah, yeah. Yeah. And um, where did you get your training? Oh, I got my training in uh, in Shiloh, Manitoba, and then we went to Devert, Nova Scotia, for the rest of the training. Mm -hmm. And from Devert, we got on a troop ship to England in a convoy. Right. And we got. To, a lot of our, most of our training was done in England. It was during the Second World War. Yeah. What, what, what kind of training was that? Oh, well, we were coastal guard and we were driving, 
and uh, I, I went to school to learn learn a driver mechanics course on mm -hmm. on vehicles. Right. Was it your choice to become a driver? Oh yes, it yeah. was my choice. It, it asked for volunteers after the first route march, and I volunteered. <laughs> I've been a truck driver <laughs> anyway. Oh right, okay. <laughs> you know what you're doing. <laughs> So tell me, tell me a little bit about what training camp was like. Oh, training camp. No, well, in Canada, with those putties on and a route march, they were horrible. You put them on tight, and then they're too tight. When you get walking, you you put them on too loose, they fall down. <laughs> so that's when I decided that I, when they asked for volunteers for truck drivers, that I was going to be one of them. <laughs> Good. <laughs> the first route march in Shiloh. Right, right. <laughs> so in England, take me through an average day of training. Well, uh, mostly we were busy hauling supplies to the regiment, mm. and we had certain things to do every day. One, one driver was designated to haul the, haul the rations. If he didn't get enough rations for the, all the rest of the drivers in the hut to have lunch after supper, well, he... He was a poor guy, you know. He he, he, was, he wasn't uh, what you call looked up. Right. Looked up on. Right, right, right. So we always put our tarp uh, turned inside, and we could throw a loaf of bread and some butter up there and some jam up there. And yeah. Like that, we had a uh, we had a lunch at night. Oh, okay. And another thing we we did we uh, the stove we had was only about ten inches round and an ignition hot. You know, right. tin roof to bear. Oh, okay. And uh, we hooked up a, a, a can of used auto engine oil mm -hmm. out of the trucks. Mm -hmm. To uh, um, tell me about your journey across the Atlantic. Well, the journey across the Atlantic, we we uh, got in the convoy. We were on the SS Orbita. A bit of or something, a bit of an old, no, no boat, mm -hmm. and uh, there were 178 ships in the convoy, and uh, off Iceland, this boat alongside of us, they told us it was a hospital ship. When the uh, submarine alarm come on, that ship there was plywood doors slid apart and. Six-inch guns shoved out to the hole, it, and it pulled out in front of the convoy at 27 knots. Not a hospital ship. Not a hospital ship. It was a double. It was actually a duel. It was actually a duel. Oh, it was, eh? Yeah, 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 yeah. It didn't have a Red Cross on it or anything. No. But it sure had some guns on it already. <laughs> and anyway, that was the back of the convoy is where these two subs attacked, I guess. They, they brought one, brought one up, they depth charged one up on top and towed it into Iceland Harbor. The other one, I don't know whether they sunk or what happened to it, but they both got it. And that's the only, and then when we got off the coast of Ireland, the fog set in. And on our stern was a ammunition ship, right. munition, ship, right. explosive, you know. And in the fog, they put out these uh, markers behind the boat. By the way, the behind that kicks up a spray. Mm -hmm. Well, I see. I was on airplane watch with a Bren gun. We we had Bren guns mounted all around the ship mm -hmm. for aircraft. Oh, okay. And we had to man those. Right. And I tell you, that was a cool job. That's that. Sometimes you wish you had two great coats on. Not <laughs> one. Was this in the winter when you went over? Uh, the, Oh, no, it's, it's, it was not winter, but it was cold. Yeah, yeah. You were away, we were up off of Iceland. Eh? We were, oh, yeah. we were, went really north, the convoy. Right. But uh, otherwise, I seen this ship behind me, almost on top of the marker, and I hollered at the bridge. He better blink a light at, at them, tell them they get too close. I didn't want to be blown up by my own ammunition ship. You know? No, no. <laughs> Otherwise than that, we uh, we got into Liverpool Harbor, and I could see all the 
ships that are sunk that are mass sticking out, mm -hmm. bombing. Mm -hmm. The German bombers bombed the harbor. And uh, then this train pulled alongside that we were going to get in. But the first, but the most important thing was we were served breakfast, and those eggs were so old, I think they could get the pension. <laughs> well, we were, we were sitting there, and the head commander of the Canadian Army come out on a tug to be greet us, and he was met with eggs flying out of the porthole. And I, he wanted to know the reason. And he was soon, he was soon told to always. No kidding, eh? So, so where were you stationed in England then? Of course, we went to Aldershot. Mm -hmm. We were sleeping in bunks that Napoleon used, I think, or, or the, were in the, they were wrought iron. We had to fill our palliasses full of hay, mm -hmm. which packed down and give you no, no spring at all. And it was pretty rough for a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we moved out of Aldershot. We got out of there. It was just a, all army all the time it wasn't there. I mean, mm -hmm. there's army all the time, all over the place there. But we moved out to different places in England. Yeah, yeah. What, what was what were the people like in the, in the UK? Oh, they were all right. They, we got out in the country all right, but uh, the people in London they they were they were a little different, you know. They were kind of stuck up sometimes. Oh, were they? Yeah. Were they? Did, did 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 you ever go on leave while you were? Oh there? yeah. Any Canadian went on leave, he usually headed for Scotland. You can walk into the Scotch, Scotch pub with a Canadian uniform on. You were lucky to be able to buy a beer. They were all piling it on front of you. No kidding. Yeah. No kidding. If you had a Scotch name, you were really in there, you know. <laughs> I bet. I bet. <laughs> I didn't have a Scotch name, but I had an English name, so I had one close to it. it was close to it, right, right. <laughs> So, so when did you uh, make it over to the mainland? Well, that was in uh, that was in June. Mm. Yeah, June, June the sixth. Oh, so you went over D-Day. D-Day. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, I landed on the on this uh, boat with my truck with three ton of ammunition on, and the old sea ship. He told me I had to back over one of these here high things with bolts on it and everything else. There were like hatches, you know. But they had a big bolt on them. He insisted I back over to it, and I insisted if I told him, I told him, I said, if I back over that, I'm going to have a flat tire. Mm. So I'm going to land in D-Day with no spare. But he wouldn't believe me. He wouldn't take no for an answer. So, okay, over I go. And about 9 o'clock at night, my back tire blew, and everybody on the ship were running around like chickens with their heads off, wondering what happened. They thought it was fire. And well, I said, you go and, I said, you go and talk to O.C. Ship. I told him what was going to happen. I said, now i got to change the tire. <laughs> well, well I, we, we don't have to do it now, at night. You can yeah. do it in the morning. And I said, in the morning, we're going to be sailing across the, the channel. That's where we're going to be. I said, you ever try to change a tire on the boat, rocking around back and forth and up and down? I said, that's just an impossibility. I said, i got to do it tonight. Mm -hmm. So me and the ammunition man, we put the tire on at night. Mm -hmm. And I landed in D-Day with was no spare. Although the tires were guaranteed to run 50 miles without damaging them, you know, with no air in them. Oh, okay. Or blowing. Right. They were that heavy. Okay. In the 60s, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I had 310 ammunition down, so I bedded down with, with the night anyway. On a, on a, we bedded down on the camouflage nets and on top of piles of ammunition. It, on the boat. On the boat. Yeah. That was our bed. Describe to me. And during, but during the night going over, there was a bunch of motorcycles all stacked up. Well, and rocking and rolling on the boat, one of them motorbikes contacted the horn button on the other bike, and I said, he said, the, the old she ship was hollering and bellering and everything else. Well, he we says, it's one of these motorbikes, we've got to find which one is touching which button. And that's, that's a, and there was 20 of them there. How are you going to tell which one is which one? In the dark, we can't put a light. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, well, eventually we did find it. So kept, kept pulling the handlebars until we found the right one. Right, right. So you didn't get much sleep, did you? No, no, I didn't get much sleep. Tell me, describe to me what D-Day was like. Well, D-Day, we we were all waterproofed up to, to go into water up, uh, well, within within a foot of the top of the cab mm. where your head is, you know. All right. But uh, as it was, there was a barge come out, and we drove on a barge. There was actually runways on it, and we they called it a rhino. And there was two big outboards on the back of it, and they they steered by one throttling back and the other one not throttling back. And that was uh, about uh, 10 o'clock on D-Day morning. We oh. landed when the beach was cleared. Oh, okay. But uh, there was uh, battleships on the, laying broadside off the broadside of shells on the beach inland. Right. So it was a real smoky place. I bet. I bet. What, was, it, was it pretty horrendous then? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I drove for four days and three nights without sleeping. Once you landed? Once I landed, yeah. Okay. Once I landed, I didn't have any sleep for three days and four nights. So. Why, why is that? Well, I was too busy. Oh, okay. Of course, I was hauling ammunition, and then I was doing this, and then I was doing that. And we'd unload the ammunition, and then we'd load something else up if they needed moved. And, uh, no kidding. And... Uh, then we had to drive back to a field where the Canadian Scottish landed to pick up ammunition. Uh, that's just light ammunition for rifle and machine gun. Right. You know, in uh, the first, the artillery, when they moved in, their first setup where they set up, they, they towed in behind them uh, kind of a stone boat that was sealed up. Like a like a sardine can, big sardine can. Oh yeah. Be about two feet high by about ten feet long by about eight feet wide. Okay. And it was all sealed up like a sardine can with ammunition in there. And they dropped it off at their first place that they set up their artillery gun. They laid right. it, they left it there. Right. And we were told to go and pick it up, pick up ammunition. Well, that, that's where we went. Well, in going into that field of grain. There were so many Canadian Scottish their soldiers laying dead. I had to get the ammunition man to walk ahead of me so I wouldn't run over some of them. Awful, awful. And then he, he had to move some of them yeah. to get in there to get the ammunition. So we put it, we got in there and we opened up the tin can. There was a way to open it up. There was a big, big bar there. You had to crank and open it up like a sardine can. Get in to get the three old three ammunition and. The, so, so what was that like, seeing all these like dead Canadians and Scottish flying around? Well, for you, did you have any thoughts, or was it just I got to get this job done? I thought you guys got to pay for this somewhere. Right. Somebody got to pay for this. Right. You know, I mean, what I could, couldn't see, and I still can't see now, why they didn't use bombers and bomb them fields to just a piece of black dirt. And wipe out all them under uh, all them trenches yeah. that were dug into that grain field, and and uh, there was even machine gun posts and everything else in there. Yeah. I mean, we had enough bombers we could have bombed that thing, so it was just black and blue plowed up yeah. Yeah. before we ever started right. in there, because right. they were in position. Yeah. Yeah. Understand? Yeah. They had to be in position when the troops landed. Right, right. Rough. Well, so tell me, what was, uh, so you were in France then? Northern yeah, yeah, France. Did, did you go to any other countries then? Yeah, we went to France. We, we, we hobbled up the coast of France. We took, took the Calais after, after we broke out of the beachhead. Mm -hmm. Broke out at, uh, we broke out at the, uh, uh, closed the gap at Filet, mm -hmm. trapped the German Kurt Meyer's army in there. Mm -hmm. But uh, before that, I was way ahead of myself. We were at the railroad track in France. That was our objective when we were there. I was ordered with three other trucks to pick up a load of mine 
and go into no man's land in the daylight over across the railroad track into no man's land a half a mile and a mile over into the bush and we had a work party and they unloaded the mines out of one truck they unloaded the mines out of Dave Lavaran's truck and he he started to unload them and he got machine gun up the front and he come back to us and told us to get out of here so we let we picked up our well, everybody we could pick up in the trucks and took off uh, like infantry men and stuff oh we had uh, we had a work party oh right about right. 20 people with us oh i see so they jumped on the trucks and we were headed out three of us were headed out and on the way out uh, my buddy he was up there he, he, there was a hatch in the truck at the, at the passenger side and he was out there with a Bren gun, firing a Bren gun, and the bullets were howling, falling on the top of the cab, and I said, well, are there holes up there? No, no, no holes up there, so I guess his bullets are falling out there, <laughs> like hail, you know. Okay. And then when we got up the railroad track where we previously crossed, they'd mined it. Our own troops had mined it. So the lead truck, I was the last truck, and he, the lead truck, there were three of us, the lead truck stopped, so everybody stopped. I told John, I said, you grab that bin gun, I'll grab this case of mags. And I said, we'll get out of this this death trap we're in, you know? Mm -hmm. I said, one bullet and this thing goes, go, is going up, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One enemy bullet and it's going up. Mm -hmm. So I got, I got out into the ditch. And uh, with John service, and then all of a sudden the truck started up. The head truck started up. Oh, yeah, we might as well go get back in again. We drove across the railroad track into a little town in France. I forget the name of it now. We unloaded our mines. The engineers come along and they booby trapped it and told the people who were living around there to get out because if it gets a direct hit from our artillery gun, it's gone. Mm. You know, half the town will be gone. Mm -hmm. It's only a little village. And I was told, we were told to fall in with brigade headquarters mm -hmm. off to one side. Mm -hmm. Then the counterattack comes through our regiment where we lost a lot of men. And they let, had to let them come in with their armor until the tank destroyers could blast them on the side. Let them come in the other side with a, like a V. Right. You, you can't stop them coming. But you can get them in there, and you you can get them in a crossfire or any tank gun. Right. So we stopped them there, and then Kurt Meyer took a lot of prisoners, and he actually coldly shot some of our fellows, which is on record. Yeah. I think it was thirty something they shot. And one was Major Hodges. They shot him with their hands tied behind the rack and and their boots off. You know. No kidding. I said, that's, that was Kurt Meyer, the 12th SS. From that day on, the Canadian Army was awful itchy on the trigger finger. If a German soldier threw his hands up and he was 12th SS, he, he was as good as dead. Really, eh? Yeah. No matter if he did throw his hands up. And we trapped him in there in the place gap, and we really cut him to pieces there. I seen the carnage in the release that you couldn't believe it. There was miles after miles after miles after horses, buggies and trucks and vehicles of all description killed. What uh, artillery didn't get the typhoon taffy tiffies we call them tiff, typhoon pilot uh, planes. Mm -hmm. They rocketed them, man. Eh? They just go go back to the airfield, load up and come back and just rocket that. We left a gap for them to run through, like rats. Would. You know, we didn't go so far, so far that side, and so far this side. Mm -hmm. You gotta get, you gotta way out to run for it, and in running for it, destroyed the Seventh Army. Uh, the right. Seventh Army. No kidding. Totally so yes. You saw a lot of fighting, eh? Hey? Um, yeah, I've seen, I've seen a lot of dead people. I don't call it. Uh, I, I'm not proud. I'm not proud of. Uh, some of the things that I've seen, mm. you know, mm. because I've seen things that uh, should never have been allowed in war. But, mm. however, that don't matter. 
it's a, it's a dog eat dog day when it comes to war. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cause you were the other guy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, I went out with. They wanted to make a sniper out of me in England, but I wouldn't read one. But I went out with a prince, a sniper one time in Holland, and he says, "Go on with Dick." He says, "I know where I can get a get a jerry. He's out going across there every day." He says. So I went with him, and this guy was packing something across a field, and uh, Prince fired at him and put a bullet between his feet. And he dove into a hole and left his bag out. And every time he'd reach out for the bag, Prince said, "Does another one go?" And he was just teasing him a bit. And then he and he quit shooting. So Jerry got him, shoved his his hat up on on his gun, and Prince said, "His head's not in it." Okay, okay, his head's not in it. All right. Then he said, "Next time his head is going to be in it." And I I was looking at him through field glasses. Eh? I seen everything. And I mean, uh, Prince shot that that helmet went flying off, and he he, he fell back in the hole. I seen that bullet just skip the dirt right right below his helmet. Good shot, eh? Oh, very good shot. Yeah. 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 Wow, what an experience! So you're in Holland too, and yeah, Holland. Yeah, I went all the way too. through Holland, and, and uh, from Holland we spent the winter in Holland and I'm making. Mm -hmm. We're guarding the bridge, right. and I had to haul ammunition up to the machine guns all the time, and in, and in doing so, I had to take up extra barrels for the Bren guns because they were burning them out, mm -hmm. shooting at stuff on the river. They had searchlights on the river. We figured, we figured Jerry might try to float something down to blow the bridge up, mm -hmm. some kind of explosive, and we were guard, guarding the bridge, so we needed that bridge to get across right. to go in, go north. Right. Right. And that was our, uh, that one winter we spent doing that. And uh, then the, the worst thing that happened is those gophers had come up in the morning and they fire a bunch of air, air bursts over the German lines. And of course, when they go, they go back then, they go back to wherever they were behind the line someplace and load up some more ammunition for the next morning. And we were left to, Take the hammer that Jerry was giving us, you know. Oh, their counterattack. The counter, he was he was throwing mortars at us and everything else he could throw, you know. If he had it, he was throwing it. So we had to sit there all day and take that, and it wouldn't end till the night time. And did men die there too? Oh yeah, the men died everywhere. Yeah, there was not one that meant much you know, static condition died. There was. Uh, uh, in, in in action when you're going into the enemy when you're attacking it's a different thing right right when you're sitting back well you you can get enough shelter to protect yourself right some kind of a building so so did you head into germany at the end or did you make no it over we there? went through the uh, went uh, through holland then okay okay yeah we were in the holland so so tell me were you and we went we, we we did go we we from Holland we went into Germany yeah we crossed the Rhine. Mm. I drove in the more water without a waterproof and what I did what I did on D Day landing with waterproof on the vehicle huh? mm -hmm. and then coming back because the Germans uh, blew the dam and they flooded the, to try to hold us back outside of Cleve. Mm -hmm. I spent half a day underneath the back end of a ta tank. When he, he was firing air bursts over us, so uh, we, uh, we had to take troops up to Cleve. Right. In campaigns during the war, then. Yeah, you might say that. I mean, ammunition, uh, right. you know, you got to run it up to the front of right. the night. Right. And, exactly. And what about the liberation of countries? Was were, was the Winnipeg Rifles involved in the liberation of any countries? Oh know? yeah, yeah, we were involved. Yeah, we were involved. We we. We chased the Germans out, not liberated them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you get a you get a nine year old a kid come up, and you think he was uh, skin and bone. They were picking into our cans that we were bean cans and pea cans that were cook was opening up and throwing in the pile. They were in there trying to see if they had a bean or a pea in there. We were given uh, in Holland. 
We got free kitchen help just for so that they could take home what was left over. No kidding. Yeah. What, what were the people like? Were very good. Like? All of them were very good. Yeah. yeah. The Dutch couldn't do enough for us. But what about France? Well, they were uh, they were all right too in a way, but they were uh, not the same as the Dutch people. You know, no. Right. There was a different attitude altogether there. Was it? Yeah. 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 Their hard up is. Well, oh, they welcomed us. The, 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 the French, to, they gave, put flowers on the truck all over the place. You know, but uh, in in Holland it was a, a different thing altogether. Really? Eh? Yeah. Yeah. The Dutch were absolutely. When a lady told me she had to walk five miles with a wheelbarrow to get a wheelbarrow load of potatoes, that's five miles there and five miles back with a wheelbarrow to get a load of potatoes to feed her family mm. during the war. And then, uh, of course, we we run across this here German, uh, Dutch SS, Dutch people that had joined the Dutch SS as soldiers mm. in the Dutch SS. Yeah. And they run a camp where they had captured Dutch underground individuals. Mm. And I tell you, that was a real mess. And when we got close to that, they started killing them. And the way they killed them, I don't know, it was a very good way. But they just took a club and beat their brains out of them, poor guys. And, of course, we took them prisoners. We took the commandant and locked him up in the cell. And uh, everybody wanted them. And uh, we turned them over to the Dutch underground at night. We turned them over. We said, we'll turn them over tonight. And we turned them over. And, of course, during the daytime, I was guarding German. These Some of these German prisoners we had, they were digging graves for to put these Dutch underground people they'd killed recently. I mean, they knew we were coming, so they killed them all. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't very nice. No, no, not at all. I don't recommend it. <laughs> but... Uh, so anyway, so this this Dutch commander turned over to the Dutch underground. He made the second lamppost from camp, from the place. That's, he was hung up there, shot, hung up, and he had to sign on a traitor. He didn't go very far. No, doesn't. Sound they didn't like waste. It. They didn't waste any time with him. No, I bet. I bet. Um, on a lighter note, let, let's talk about um, things like, what was your uniform like? Uniform? Yeah. Oh, it was a good, good, uh, good uh, uniform. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. It was warm, it was hot, <laughs> it was cold sometimes. Uh, um, did you wear anything different as a driver than others would have worn? No, I had a leather leather vest, that's about all. Right. right. I had a leather vest. And, and what sort of supplies? And I had a pair of coveralls when I wanted to do some dirty work. Right, okay. And su supplies? What sort of supplies would you have carried with you? Well, we uh, we had our own, uh, the, the, the MT section or the driver uh, transport section had their own cook. Oh, okay. When we had a section where we went to and we had F -S long or A -S long, F -S long, long, we had a cook. Mm -hmm. Cook by the name of Barney. I remember him in in the the Hawkwall Forester. We were in the Hawkwall, and we had a place where we fell back to with the drivers. They wanted to get the trucks back from the front. You see, I mean, they, you bring up the supplies in, in the nighttime, and you go back in the daytime. Right. So anyway, and, and so what were what was living conditions like then? Oh. Better in the front, I'll tell you. Yeah, yeah. Well, describe to me what would uh, what would have been like up in the front. Oh well, they 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 they, they uh, kept their head down in the daytime and and, and uh, tried to get some sleep at night. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. with sentries. You know what I mean? Patrols. There was night patrols and everything else up there. Right. I mean, they had to counteract patrols. Mm. Okay. What about eating arrangements, things like that? Well, you got your grub when you when the cook when uh, when you uh, when you had time, right. you know. Right. You know, it was you were supposed to have breakfast and supper, but uh, 
sometimes uh, you got compost boxes, right? Okay. Up front, in the front, they had compost boxes. Right, right. And they were named A, B, C, and uh, the best one was A, I think it had the fruit in them. Mm. We get compost boxes too, but in the truck drivers got them. Oh, okay. We had compost boxes. And this would be like a the front was The front was the one, it's all different stuff in there, canned stuff and stuff like that, cigarettes and everything else in that in that box. And that would, uh, so at night time, they, they'd go back and they'd pick up a box and they'd take it up to, the, to their front. Or they'd have a work party and sent out to get it to, for the platoon or something like that. So okay. One couple of men would go back and get their box and pack it up. Right. And then they proceed to eat it in the slip trenches or wherever the hell they were. Oh, okay. Well, well what about you then? Did, was there a mess that you ate at then? Uh, no, no, we were out. Uh, like when you went away from the front, there, was it just, the, I mean, there was cooks there, right? And there were cooks there, yeah. There was kind of a half big kitchen. Oh, I see. I see. Well, I went across at Leopold Canal, I went across in. Uh, with a pro corporal, uh, after we pushed up these uh, rain gun carriers with the flamethrowers and blew the frame across the canal, and the next morning somebody said there was two dead sheep over there. Well, well, we're just tired of bully beef. So this uh, one corporal, I forget his name now, he, he's a pro corporal, uh, battalion police, pro. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, I'll go with you, Dave. Okay. You know where they are? Yeah, across this little footbridge. Oh, we, we go over there. And I remember one German, this sheep was laying along side of some Germans there. One, one, one German corporal, he had Russian front ribbons on him. Well, I said, he didn't go very far, did he? And uh, we grabbed the sheep and we started across this footbridge. And Jerry decided he was going to shell the, the canal. He was sending waves down there about four feet high, you know. And he, put shells in there and this footbridge so the corporal's head he's pulling the sheep and I'm steering it behind two two sheep and eventually the waves got so bad uh, too rough I, I I gotta go back you 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 pull the sheep okay so he pulled the sheep across and after the waves quit down I went across <laughs> and we got back to camp where the Barney the cook was and I said well if I'm going to eat this the sheep, I'm going to skin it. I said, because I don't think anybody knows how to skin a sheep because you don't, you don't let the wool touch the meat or you're going to be eating wool. You're going to really take sheep. <laughs> so I skinned the sheep. Barney done a beautiful job. He got a big hot pots of oil going there and he put the put the mutton in a batter. And man, oh man, that was a treat of treats. I bet. You know, I bet. after bully beef. And yeah, yeah. What about things like mail? Eh? Was was the mail service good? Well, the hit and miss. They might find you five days later or something after the mail came in. You know, in this, when they ever found you. Yeah. Would, would you get mail from home? Oh, yeah. You get yeah. Mail from home. It was it coming through. There was a mail section. You know what I mean? Yeah. And did you look forward to mail? Yeah, we looked forward to the army army magazine oh okay that told us what was going on you know. oh right so you're just thirsting for news Maple leaf. right so you really like to get news from home and oh yeah, yeah yeah what about um social life in the service well you socialize when you got got in touch that's over there well in holland there we had uh, we were camped out on one field and the dutch dutch girls they all invited us to a dance we didn't know they were going to dance it in in uh, wooden shoes. My God, it was sure hard on the toes. I bet. <laughs> but they could dance pretty good in wooden shoes. Could they? Yeah. 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 Um, what about um, did you did you have friendships that developed while you were in the service? Oh yeah, you had friends. You know, I mean, say we. We we're all buddies in the Sanford section, you know, yeah. and we we're all pretty close knit. Yeah. Well, I walked into a, we were in one forest we had there we had Barney the cook. He uh, he he cook of anything you captured. I went into 
I went into my farmer's yard and there was a nice steer there. I pulled out my P38, shot the steer in the head. We loaded it into the truck and he, the farmer come kayaking out. I said, you want to be laying inside there with the steer? I said, you better be back in that house. You guys are thirsting for some good food, eh? Huh? Hunger for good food. I said, you probably stole that steer off the, the Dutchman anyway. They're just over the border. Right. You know? So we hauled that back to camp and we hung it up in the trees and we had meat to grow. Is this when you were in Germany then? Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, I see. What about um, your commanding officers? Did you have any relationship with them? Oh, yeah. We had a good officer. We had a good colonel. Yeah. Our colonel was a good one. We, we ended up with the one we had a D-Day with him. He was crazy. Sent four trucks into no man's land. But previously, there was Germans all over that field, and they pulled back to form a counterattack. Mm -hmm. And we were in there trying, trying to put haul in mines. We were, we, we didn't even time to lay them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No kidding, eh? Um, is there one memory or experience that stands out for you the most? One memory. One yeah. memory or experience. Well, when I was in the brigade headquarters and a counterattack went through, I said. Uh, a sniper took a crack at me when I was sitting alongside a tree and he blew, blew, blew bark in my face, I tell you. And I hit the dirt. And there was a long guy laying along, uh, sitting alongside the other side of the tree, a scotty. I said, you better take an angle on that bullet. And I said, call that Sherman over there with a 50 caliber, on limber, he is 50 caliber. And start knocking branches off that trees over there. I said, it started the bottom. You decide what trees he's got to start on. Well, if the, the tank started the 50 caliber up and the branches were flying. And, and Scotty says, well, he says, a rifle fell down. And I said, he can't have two rifles up there. I'm getting out of here. Because I figured he was still on me. Yeah, yeah. But I bet that's the closest I've come. That's close. That's about four inches from my ear. <laughs> Tell me about your feelings on VE Day. Well, I was in a in uh, Germany, in a barn, with a pitchfork, trying to find a drink of snaps in the, in the, in the, in the uh, mangers of the, in the hay, because that's where the Germans buried their whiskey, eh? Oh, okay. Did oh, you find uh, any? In comes one of my buddies and says, it's all over, it's all over. I just been over to the mechanic's tent, and he said, they got, they had a, they had a tank radio in there to get news, eh? Mm -hmm. And uh, it was all over. Uh, I don't think it's all over. I said, here, our artillery still firing. Well, it's all over. Well, okay, you say so, but I said, they're still firing guns. Can't be over when they're firing guns. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I go back and I listen to the radio, and sure enough, it was going to be, they were going to stop shooting at a certain time, eh? and that was going to be it. All still. All still. All quiet. All quiet. Did you attend? Did you attend any VE Day celebrations or celebrate in any way? Oh yeah, we celebrated. We celebrated. We were in a, a German town, and I tell you, we had a real ball. We captured enough booze, I tell you, to keep us going for a day and a night. <laughs> <laughs> and the officers never bothered us. You know, right. if you want a party, a party. Right. Right. So tell me about the day you were informed that you were coming back to Canada and, and, and making it back here. Well, uh, we, we, you had to have enough points to come back. Right. You had to be uh, really a five-year five man eh? or four-year man, enough points to go back because they had, still had to have a regiment for the Army of Occupation. Eh? Oh, I see. Well, uh, we were running into no man's land picking up these DPs or people from that were slaves on the farms and stuff like that, the Poles and Polish people uh, and French people and everything else. And we were take, picking them up and then we we're taking them to a de detox center, you know, where they were processed. Right. And that was something. I went to one farm there. They had the farmer cornered and they, one guy had a rifle on him and they wanted me to give him orders to shoot him. I can't do that. I said, that's not, 
That's not. He's got to be convicted in a court before anybody can do anything with him. Mm -hmm. You give me that rifle. They give me the rifle. And they believe me. I talked them into it. Mm -hmm. So I guess they were. Well, they were ready to shoot him because he, be, he beat those people something horrible, you know? Oh. And he treated them horrible mm -hmm. over all these years. There was a lot of hate there. Mm -hmm. Even the women. Mm -hmm. Oh, gee, if they, they, they got a hold of him, they'd, they'd have scratched his eyes out. Oh. Dear me, dear me. So, what was it like getting home? Well, getting home was a real celebration. Was it? Yeah. <laughs> a real celebration, yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we come up back on the SS or Orbital, the sister ship of the Titanic or something, I don't know. It, it was supposed to be a sister ship of the Titanic or something we come back on. And off the coast of Newfoundland, the, the orders come from the bridge that we were, there was an ice field coming over the horizon. We looked, and sure enough, there they come. We had to put great coats out on in the morning and go on deck. Okay. And we were surrounded. We floated all night with the, with the foes, eh, and the convoy. Oh. It must have been quite the scene. Huh? It must have been quite the sight. And these mountains of mountains of ice, you know, and there's, there's only one fifth above water, and there's five fifths below water, mm -hmm. and you're, you're floating with them things up there. It's, it it kind of changes the weather, you know. <laughs> I bet, I bet. But we we spent a whole day wiggling ourselves out of that. Mm -hmm. We weren't in convoy either. We were we were on our own. Yeah. Coming back, the yeah. war was over. Yeah. So what was it like stepping foot on home soil? Oh, uh, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. But uh, we realized that we were every troop ship, and what we were really dissatisfied with is Mackenzie King. When we come near Ottawa with a troop train, he never even sent a representative to welcome us home or do nothing. He sat in that den where he sits, wherever he sit, mm -hmm. and he just stayed there. Mm -hmm. The only person that welcomed us home was the Salvation Army. Oh, really? Yeah. How about that? The only person to give us a cup of coffee was the Salvation Army. And here we fought five years overseas for Mr. Fugendi King, the Prime Minister. He's a gutless wonder, as far as I was concerned. What were, what were the people like, the civilians like, towards you when you got Oh, there? they were happy. They come down and want to sell us beer. In and in, in, in the French area there, when we la before we landed, the ship was docked, and these French boys were swimming in the water. And we were throwing English coins over, and they were diving for them. This is in Quebec. In Quebec. Yeah. In Quebec City. Okay. And and so when when you arrived home, what what sort of things were provided for you? Oh, they they put us in a, a billet there. For uh, to be processed, uh, mm -hmm. dis discharged. Mm -hmm. We had 30 days. We could wear our uniform 30 days. We had 30 days of grace. We could still wear our uniform and get a half half fare on a plane, a train, eh? Okay. Train. So they uh, they had to pay our. Uh, we could go back to our hometown and uh, celebrate a little bit, and then. Mm -hmm. I decided, uh, well, I, they give me a job working in a, in a creamery. Mm -hmm. I didn't like that, no way. Uh, tell you, that wasn't my piece of cake. No way. Uh, I still had 30 days to get a fare. So my dad was out on the coast here in Vancouver. So I, gra I grabbed a passenger train and paid half fare in right. Vancouver. Right. I got out of that creamery. <laughs> It was a sweat book. I said, if you go from the army to this thing, it's just crazy. Yeah, what was it like going back into civilian life? Was it hard? Yeah, you miss your buddies. Yeah. You miss your buddies. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you're, you're people that you serve with, you know. But And I was sitting in my sister's place in Dauphin, uh, having lunch or something, and a... Uh, 
a car backfired or blew a tire in the street, an explosion. You know what I ended up under the table? That really? was just a reaction. Yeah. She said, what are you doing out there? I said, sis, when you hear something like that, you, 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 you die. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> I said, it's just a natural thing. Mm -hmm. you, you had five years of war, mm -hmm. you didn't hear an explosion, you hit the dirt. Yeah, oh, I like that. Yeah. yeah. What, uh, do you think that veterans have been treated well when they returned home? Oh, yeah, we, we were, we, we weren't treated well by the government of Canada, I'll tell you. Not when Mackenzie King wouldn't have come out there and meet. Mm. I think it's an awful poor situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about the DVA? How are they? Department of Veterans Affairs? Yeah. Yeah, they have treated us not too bad. Uh, in later years, they have treated us more, better, right. on account of the, there's few of us, so they can afford to treat us. <laughs> That's about the size of it. Do you belong to any veterans organizations? Yeah, I belong to the, the Legion yeah. 83. Yeah, and, and what sort of things does the Legion provide you with? Well, they provide with, uh, the only thing about the Legion is, you see, I quit smoking 40 years ago, or I wouldn't be talking to you right now. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. that's the way I look at it. Mm -hmm. And I go to the Legion, and they got smoking in the same room, they got it, they ain't divided at all, it's just this, there's, all they got is a two before fence around where, where you're supposed to smoke and the two before fence, other side of the two before fence is where you're non smoking. Right. It's crazy. You're breathing the same air. Yeah. Yeah. That regulation, I won't go there. I go there once a year on Armistice Day. On Armistice Day, do you? So how do you observe Remembrance Day? Hmm? How do you observe Remembrance Day? Well, I march and remember my buddies. Yeah. Yeah. And the fellows I've lost, the friends I've lost. Yeah. And and you just do it with you and your wife? Is yeah. It? Yeah. No, not the wife. No, she don't go. No. Um, what about um, the 50th anniversary? Remember the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Holland in World War II? Did you do anything special on that day? No, I didn't know anything special, I don't think. I, uh, I, I could have went to, I should have went to Holland, but I still might go to Holland mm -hmm. for a trip. Mm -hmm. Why for not? Yeah. Remember of D D. Right. Do do you still maintain contacts or friendships with people you serve with? Oh yeah, so I keep in contact. I have a buddy up at the uh, uh up at uh, uh, Ashcroft. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. And but I visit every time I go on a holiday I just stop in to Stan Buser's place in Ashcroft. I served with him. He he was with me in the Transport too. He was a driver. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. And and what about other guys from like the Westminster Regiment, things like that? Do you see other guys around a bit? Or? No, I don't know any of them. Uh, I was with the Winnipeg Rifles. Yeah. Know. So they were uh, they were in a different. Uh, they were in the Italy. Right. Well, one of the guys with Westminster Regiment, uh, I hunted moose with. Who was uh, was. Uh, Walt Jackson. Oh yeah. He's now in the George Darby Hospital. He's bedridden. Oh okay. Yeah. He's bedridden, and and I go to see him once in a while. Right. Uh, is, is is it hard to to see and these these old friends sort of getting sick and things like that? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't like to see him in that situation. No. Yeah. I wouldn't want to be in that situation. No. Might yeah. sure be dead in that situation. Really, eh? Yeah. Well, he he brought it on himself, and he moved, broke his hip, you know what I mean? He, his own his own fault, too. Right. Really, yeah. right, right. really, he was in. It is his problem, you know. Right. If he just stayed away from a, that bottle long enough, he'd have been. He'd have, he probably wouldn't have broke his hip. Right. 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 And do so bedridden. Right. Well, I think that's about it for the interview. Unless, do you think there's anything I've missed or something you want to add to the interview? Want to add? I'm sorry to say that today, 
the Canadian Army and the government of Canada is at fault for not keeping an armed force up to date. Mm -hmm. We are we are a country that has no we can't put a we could maybe put one division in the bloody field. Mm. But we'd have to scrape the barrel to do that. Mm. And they gotta beg them to join the army. Mm. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, I hear you. You, you, it's, you can read about it in the paper all the time. Yeah. Yeah. We're undermanned and understaffed and everything else. Yeah. Well, why? We've got lots of young guys out there that haven't that uh, probably would join if they had a had a reason. Right. But they haven't got the they haven't got the same mentality that we had. I don't know. Uh, all I think about is uh, having a fast big car and a fast life. Mm. Huh? Mm -hmm. We we were we when everybody joins, you join. A little different now, hey? A little real different now. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Mr. Peel. I appreciate it. Well, I don't know. I hope you did. <laughs> did something with it, anyway.